Hey everyone, we're gonna give it till about 12.05 until we get started, just so we can wait for some late arrivals. So just hang tight and we'll get started soon. Hey everyone, uh, thank you for joining our Intro to Tech Equity webinar. My name is Herman Calderon. I'm the Community Manager for Tech Equity. Um, in my role, I get to engage with our supporters through some of our events and I get to engage with you all here. So as we go through the presentation, if you have any trouble or technical issues, please drop those into the chat. And if you have any questions, please drop those into the Q&A function. My colleague and Director of Advocacy, Megan Abel, will be helping you all with that. Hi hey folks, really happy to see you all here today. As Herman said, we'll be taking questions for about the last 15 to 20 minutes of the webinar. Um, and you can use the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen to submit those questions. And I'll be monitoring the questions and the chat throughout the conversation today. 
Cool. Thanks, Megan. A little bit about what we'll be covering today. We'll talk about why Tech Equity exists as an organization and how we got started. We'll talk about the key issues we have identified to help us understand the problems that need to be solved. And we'll talk about how we can take action to address our region's most pressing economic issues. But before moving on with the conversation about tech equity, I wanted to acknowledge that we're hosting this webinar during very tough times, uh, particularly tough for Black people. And as an organization, we've discussed how best to respond to the situation, including changing or canceling some of the events that we're hosting throughout the next couple of weeks. But we feel it's still important for us that when thinking of issues like police violence and like police brutality, that we also address larger racial structural inequities within our economic systems that are withholding and supporting a police state. So we wanna continue hosting conversations such as these and providing a space to talk about structural racial inequities. And I encourage you all to support organizations that are on the ground organizing just as much as organizations that are responding to racial inequities within our economy. And as an organization, we released a statement with much more information, which you can find on our website. And we've included ways that you can step up and organizations that you can support if you're able to. So why are we here? Uh, Tech Equity got started because some of its earliest founders and members saw the symptoms of growing inequity within their neighborhoods and understood that there was a perception that tech and tech workers were the cause of the problem. They noticed things such as rising rents, displacement, traffic, and an increase in people experiencing homelessness. And as they talked to others, they realized that they weren't alone in their concerns and that they as tech workers were uniquely positioned to help contribute to some solutions. Especially now in the face of the pandemic, we're seeing that the affordability crisis gets so much worse with an increased burden placed on low-income people and communities of color. Many of our neighbors are uncertain as to how they'll continue to manage what's already an untenable situation. And at the same time, tech workers have remained relatively unscathed. As a result, the COVID-19 crisis has the potential to further exacerbate our inequality within our region. So this is the state of the crisis in the Bay Area. I think the fact that rents are rising shouldn't really be a surprise to anyone on this call because we all already know and feel this. And while some Californians are very successful in the tech-driven economy here, the average salaries for tenants have actually decreased slightly. And this is really a sharp contrast with the narrative of tech success. And without tech at the table to work together to address our shared crisis, it's understandable as to why community members are frustrated. Before the pandemic, Unemployment was hovering just around 4% and people were already struggling to make ends meet. But since the virus hit, about 1.6 million Californians have filed for unemployment. Meanwhile, experts believe that it's not likely that rents will fall much during this economic downturn. Rents may go down eventually, but are more likely to flatline and people's incomes won't rebound quickly enough. So renters will actually be in a worse position overall. And as instability and uncertainty continues, we'll see more of our neighbors being pushed out into homelessness or worse. Communities are frustrated and considering the graph we just looked at, it really comes to no surprise. I know for myself growing up in the Bay Area, my whole life I've been able to see both sides of the coin. I have friends and family who are worried and scared about the changes they're seeing in their communities and what that means for them but also have friends and family who have pursued jobs within the tech sector and have really found lots of success. However, we see that when tech begins to shoulder the blame, it's creating an us versus them dynamic that's further dividing the community. We know that tech workers care and that they wanna help and they don't wanna to contribute to this deepening divide. While we're unsure as to how long we'll be managing this new normal caused by the current pandemic, it's important to note that many within the tech sector remain relatively unscathed. And more than most other sectors, tech has been able to make the transition to working from home with little disruption. So now more than ever, tech workers and tech companies have an opportunity to support more equitable solutions in our communities. And we have an opportunity to use our unique positions of privilege to support our neighbors, but it can be hard to know how to best engage in a time with such uncertainty. 
because of our affordability crisis, which is now compounded by the virus, we're at risk of losing so many critical components in our community that make the Bay Area a hub of diversity and innovation. And over the last few decades, the housing costs have skyrocketed due in part to limited supply. The housing crisis was already incredibly challenging for many families prior to COVID-19. And now as thousands are filing for unemployment weekly, already unaffordable rents are impossible to meet. As a result, we've seen longtime residents being forced out and we've seen how difficult it is for low and middle income people to live near their jobs. So while some workers are finding success, many others are struggling to just make ends meet. Families were already challenged by the status quo and now find themselves unable to weather this new crisis. But we don't think that it has to be this way. At Tech Equity Collaborative, we're as optimistic as ever about the tech industry's potential to drive broad-based growth that's accessible to everyone, but it's clear that it's not gonna happen on its own. We can make it out of this crisis stronger than we were before, but only if we're investing in the people and the institutions that are serving our communities. We have to show up and we have to do so in partnership with those in the community that are feeling the most pain if we're able to dismantle the notion that tech is the enemy. We believe that a more engaged tech sector is a more ethical tech sector, that connecting tech workers and companies to issues where they live in will result in more ethical decisions at work and engagement within our communities. And we know we can do this and the first step is to show up. So you all have done a great first step by showing up to this conversation and figuring out how to get involved. Our goal at Tech Equity is to change the conditions in which the tech sector is growing. We believe effective structural change will eliminate a culture and policies that institutionalize inequity, leading to stronger and more resilient communities. We help tech workers approach these big problems and engage in this system change in three major ways. So our programs educate you about the most critical civic issues where you live through some of the book club discussions that we host, panel discussions with experts, webinars such as these, and voter guides. We activate you on a policy advocacy agenda that results in a more inclusive economy in your community through things such as voter turnouts, signature gathering, and lobbying. And finally, we connect you on a personal level to the community you live in and the people who live there outside of your tech bubble through some of our programming and campaigns. The good news is that members at Tech Equity are showing up for the community. Tech workers are members of the community and should be at the table working alongside non-tech community members. Together, we can advocate for solutions to our most pressing shared problems. COVID-19 has shown us that the health of the community depends on all of us, and we have to work together to address underlying issues that drive inequity within our tech economy. So our two focus areas at Tech Equity Collaborative are housing and workforce and labor. So while housing costs are a core part of this, the, the issues really are intertwined and intersect in many ways. Because where you live affects your access to opportunity and what job you have affects where you're able to afford to live. So our goal at Tech Equity Collaborative is bold, comprehensive change by companies and government led by the tech workforce. And these issues have only gotten more urgent in the face of the current pandemic. And we're all well positioned to adapt our agenda to these new realities. So let's learn a little bit more about inequity in our neighborhoods. The affordability crisis really is decades in the making. And the policy choices that we've made over the course of decades have set us up for this level of pain our community is feeling, especially now during the coronavirus pandemic. In the 1930s, the federal government instituted a policy that's still felt today, especially within communities of color in the Bay Area, and that policy is redlining. So redlining was a process in which the homeowners loan corporation federal agency gave neighborhoods ratings to guide investment. And the policy is named for the red or hazardous neighborhoods that were deemed the riskiest. So on maps, those neighborhoods were literally redlined as we can see with the image on the screen. And those communities that were deemed risky investments or redlined didn't receive any investment. These neighborhoods were predominantly home to communities of color and that really is by no accident. The hazardous ratings were in large part based on racial demographics. In other words, redlining was a discriminatory and a racist policy. 
It made it hard for residents to get loans for home ownership or maintenance of their homes for something like building a new roof. Consequently, redlining led to cycles of disinvestment, including development and production within these neighborhoods. So there's a terrible history of underinvestment, underbuilding, and exclusion in the Bay Area. And often those communities that have historically been underinvested in and have been redlined are the very same communities that are at risk of gentrification today. The crisis we're, in, we're living in is decades in the making, way before tech. And it's not unique to the Bay Area. There are many, many cases of redlining all throughout California and all throughout the country. So by preventing entire neighborhoods from accessing capital, these neighborhoods were unable to build the schools that they needed, small businesses, and a community that fostered economic success and opportunity for everyone. And it caused many of the people who have lived in redline neighborhoods for generations to fall in and stay in liquid asset poverty. Now you may be asking yourselves, what is liquid asset poverty? Well, someone is considered to be in liquid asset poverty if they don't have enough savings to cover their basic expenses for three months after experiencing an income shock, like a global pandemic that affects your income, a huge rent increase, a sudden loss of a job, things like that. And it impacts almost one out of two Californians. So 46% of Californians are in liquid asset poverty and people of color and lower income people are affected at much higher rates. So 67% of Latino households are in liquid asset poverty and 63% of African American households are in liquid asset poverty. And there really isn't a single reason as to why this is happening, but many years of policy decisions have led to these outcomes, which are especially burdensome for communities of color. And these policy decisions often predate tech's arrival, but tech workers can now take a role in supporting better policies moving forward. The twin forces of a housing shortage, particularly with affordable housing, and wages that have not covered the cost of living have created a regional crisis that has hindered opportunity, growth, and prosperity for families and businesses alike. As you can imagine, these statistics will likely be impacted by the outcome of, of the pandemic we're currently in. And many people within these communities were already struggling with unemployment on a steep rise and city and state budgets that are being depleted by emergency response efforts Many of our neighbors are facing increased instability and likely will for years to come if we don't implement solutions now. The cost of living was already high. So let's take a look at how a worker, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, earning minimum wage fares the current rental market. So this is what it takes to afford an average two bedroom apartment in San Francisco. If you're making $120,000 per year, you can afford the average two bedroom apartment working a regular eight hour day. However, if you're making minimum wage in San Francisco, you need to work 30 hours a day to afford that two bedroom. So there's only 24 hours in a day. So we're setting up an impossible situation for low wage workers to be able to afford to live in the city. And just to keep it in context, it's not just people outside the tech sector that are struggling to afford San Francisco. There's a common misconception that all tech workers are paid these lavish salaries. However, not every salaried employee is making six figures. Some salaried tech employees like those in customer success or marketing are paid salaries that are considered to still be low income in the Bay Area. And even further away from this image of a wealthy tech worker are the thousands of contracted and contingent workers like security guards, custodians, cooks, bus drivers, are working long hours to maintain tech companies but are receiving minimum benefits and are not paid as much. So you have to have a good salary to be able to afford your apartment, but why is your apartment so expensive to begin with? Well, rents are going up due in part to lack of supply. And this chart is showing us what we should be building. The state sets goals for how much housing local communities should build to keep up with demand and population growth. And these are called RHNA goals, R-H-N-A, and that stands for Regional Housing Needs Allocation. And as you can see, we're doing a pretty good job of meeting our RHNA goal for the above moderate income housing bracket. That's the bracket all the way to the right. And that's affordable for people making a good salary that we talked about earlier. But we're not building anywhere close enough housing for lower and moderate income people. 
And as housing costs have skyrocketed with production of affordable housing not being matched, working class residents and communities of color have been driven out of our urban core and pushed into the outer, outer edges of our region, further away from job centers and supportive services. And some residents have been displaced from the region altogether. So remember when someone tells you that we just need to build more housing, it's important that we ask them, build more housing for whom? Again, we're not building enough housing at lower levels of affordability. And because we're not building enough housing that's affordable for lower and middle income people, they're leaving while our communities, while higher income folks are coming in and staying in. So for every high income person coming into the Bay Area, a low income person is being pushed out at about a one to one ratio. So displacement really is driven by policy choices. And we may see this ratio of displacement continue to rise as the COVID-19 crisis continues to progress. The folks who are the most rent burdened are in, often in lower wage jobs and lower wage jobs are getting hit the hardest by this crisis. And we can't build our way out to solve our problems, but it is true that we don't have enough homes for people. So as you can see, the affordability crisis we're living out today is a result of bad policy choices. The good news is that we can make a different set of choices moving forward. At Tech Equity, we envision a world where a growing tech-driven economy creates opportunity for everyone and where tech sector employees and companies are engaged and active participants in making our communities better places to live. We've identified structural changes that need to happen in order to achieve this vision but we won't be able to achieve it without the necessary policy change. So here's what we've identified in the housing world. I'm gonna give a brief overview of each of these, but if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them at the end. We need to take an above all approach to tackling our housing affordability crisis. And that starts with production, preservation, and protection. So for production, we need to make sure that we're building more housing, specifically at lower levels of affordability. And we can do this through zoning and permitting reform that brings down the cost of constructing housing by removing delays and lengthy administrative processes that make it too expensive to build. Preservation. We need to make sure that we're providing more resources to subsidize and maintain and improve existing affordable housing. And finally, protection. We need to protect existing tenants from displacement. It's gonna take a long time to build the housing that we need. But in the meantime, we need to protect existing tenants from displacement. Especially now, we need to be thinking about short and long-term solutions for preservation and protection, because many of our neighbors are more at risk now than ever. An economic downturn is also an ideal time to lean heavily into producing more affordable housing as the cost of labor, materials, and land may decrease slightly with the current market conditions. We also need to make sure that we all get enough compensation and benefits to live a healthy and stable life. We want to ensure that companies are doing their part to contribute to the communities they exist within, that the people in the surrounding communities are able to access these jobs and that these jobs pay fair wages and benefits regardless of the role they're in. So we were excited to see many companies step up and commit to continue paying their contingent workers as offices were closed due to the virus. But we need to ensure that that same care and thoughtfulness goes into supporting these workers well beyond the pandemic we're currently in. And again, I'll fly through these, but I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. We need to make sure that there are equitable on-ramps. There needs to be more access to good, paying, high opportunity jobs. We need corporate responsibility. Companies need to be conscious of their impact in their communities, and need to work with community leaders and organizations to ensure that their economic success benefits their neighbors as well. And finally, we need to make sure that all jobs are good jobs. We need to make sure that contractors and contingent workers are treated fairly. So once again, there are tons of ways in which you can get involved. We host tons of educational events. We have monthly event series, which you can sign up to on our events page to go deeper on some of the issues that we discussed today. Uh, next week, we're hosting a webinar on the California budget and how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted it. So that's on June 18th. And then on June 25th, we'll be having a webinar about uh, the potential of tech leaving the Bay Area and what that would look like. So if you're interested in those, 
you can sign on to those webinars. They'll also be during lunchtime, um, the 18th and the 25th, and you can find more information on our website. We have monthly member meetings, so members have exclusive content and have an opportunity to weigh in into our endorsements and policy platforms. So if you're interested in becoming a member, you can become a member at techequitycollaborative.org slash membership. If you're interested in advocacy, you can volunteer to support a campaign to close corporate property tax loopholes and restore $12 billion every year that California communities need to recover from this crisis. Or you can help us with corporate policy through our responsible contracting campaign. And the final way you can engage with us is through engaging with the community. So we connect tech workers and non-tech community members through volunteer opportunities such as for COVID-19 relief. So we've partnered with community organizations that are providing rapid response services to keep our community digitally connected. If you're a designer or an engineer, you can volunteer for one of our civic tech projects where we're building digital tools that support renters and underserved communities to get access to the information that they need. So this is how we work. We try to make it as accessible and as easy as possible to plug in and build community in the process. So what can you do today? You can do three things right after you get off this call. You can tell a friend about Tech Equity Collaborative's work. Our movement really is strengthened by having the voices of more supporters join us. You can become a member of Tech Equity. Building a more equitable Bay Area economy means that we all need to pitch in and we're at it every day serving as that conduit between tech workers and the hard work of creating opportunity and prosperity for everyone. And one of the easiest ways you can do your part is by donating. Your financial support means that we can be a powerful voice for our community as we seek solutions to some of our region's biggest challenges. And finally, you can take action on one of our campaigns, which I'll be talking about next. The first campaign we have is Prop 13 Reform, also known as Schools and Communities First Funding Act. So local governments from public health departments to school districts are currently leading the fight against COVID-19. However, because of California's broken property tax system, they're doing it without all the resources that they need. So our coalition, Schools and Communities First, has successfully submitted 1.7 million signatures to qualify our initiative for the ballot. And they'll bring back $12 billion to our school and communities by closing a corporate tax loophole and making sure that corporations are paying their fair share. So you can support this campaign by sharing your story about why funding our local services are so vital or by volunteering to phone bank to contact voters. The next campaign we have is the Fair Chance at Housing campaign, also known as Banning the Box in Alameda County. And this campaign is about helping removing barriers for formerly incarcerated folks to have more access to housing after being released from prison. So we've successfully had ordinances passed in Oakland and in Berkeley in partnership with uh, the organization Just Cities. So for this uh, campaign, you can sign up or donate to support these efforts as they expand these protections to the entirety of Alameda County. And finally, the last campaign is the Tenant Protection Act of 2019, which really highlights the work that we do at Tech Equity Collaborative and how we partner with community organizations and center the needs of people who are feeling the pain of the affordability crisis more acutely than those of us in tech. So working alongside community members, legislators, and relevant stakeholders, we were able to identify a new policy intervention that could protect more renters than any law before in California history. And the policy prevents tenants from arbitrary and unjust evictions by requiring landlords to have a good cause for evicting a tenant. It also prevents unfair rent increases and prevents price gouging by capping rent increases at no more than 10%. So as a result of our strong coalition, we were able to introduce a bill to the California legislator that was signed into law last October in 2019. So the Tenant Protection Act now extends protections to 8 million California renters. But passing the law on its own isn't enough. We also wanted to ensure that tenants knew their rights and could advocate for themselves. So we reached out to our tech equity volunteers who donated their time and their skills to help create a new website that would help tenants navigate their rights under this new law. So that website's live, it's tenantprotections.org and it's already been viewed by 
viewed and used by thousands of California renters. So if you know anyone that's a renter and could benefit from this website, once again, that's tenantprotections.org. Once again, you can do three things right after you get off this call. You can tell a friend about our work, you can become a member of Tech Equity Collaborative, or you can take action on one of our campaigns. And COVID-19 has really exposed how deep the cracks in our economy and our communities run. And when cities are setting aside issues like housing and fair labor conditions, it deepens inequity and leaves us vulnerable to things like recessions, future pandemics, and more. And because we've overlooked these issues in the Bay Area, it could set us back years in terms of recovery. And if you take one thing away from this uh, presentation, we hope it's a realization that more equity within our communities actually strengthens our economy and safeguards us from a future crisis. So we hope you'll join us in advocating for a future that works for everyone. Uh, I'm sure that was quite a bit of information to absorb, so I'm gonna open up the floor for questions. And like I said, Megan Abel, our Director of Advocacy, will be joining us for this portion. So if you have any questions, make sure you drop them into the Q&A box. Thanks so much, Herman, for taking us through um, a really informative uh, presentation. We don't yet have any questions in the Q&A, um, so I'll take a moment to invite everyone on the webinar to drop some questions into the Q&A function. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd love to discuss whatever's on your mind. Yeah, and one thing I forgot to mention was that we'll be sending out a follow-up email with more information uh, about some of the events I talked about, a little bit about the campaigns, and you'll get a link to the recording and to the presentation slides. So keep an eye out for that. Great, so we have a question from um, an anonymous attendee that asks, are you working on the proposition to abolish Costa Hawkins and allow more rent control? Uh, I don't think we're working on a proposition to abolish Costa Hawkins. Um, we have our legislative priorities, which you can check out on our blog post, but I'll let Megan um, give more information about that. Yeah, so not everyone on this webinar is probably aware of what Costa Hawkins is, so I'll um, give a short explanation of that just so everyone's aware of what we're talking about. Uh, Costa Hawkins um, was uh, a law passed by the California legislature um, in the 90s, I believe, uh, that limits cities' ability to enact certain kinds of rent control. Um, and uh, there's uh, a measure that will be on the ballot uh, this November, which is supported by the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, which would remove Costa Hawkins, um, which to be clear, doesn't give everyone rent control automatically. It would just allow cities to enact a more comprehensive rent control if that's what their local municipality decides to do. Um, so that's, that's what we're talking about here. Um, we're a relatively small and young organization, um, so we have pretty limited capacity in terms of where we can direct our energy. Um, and we have gone all in on the Schools and Communities First campaign, which will be on the ballot this November. Um, as Herman discussed, Schools and Communities First will uh, reform our corporate property tax system and raise $12 billion uh, for local services around things that we truly, truly need in our communities like homeless services, construction of affordable housing, and so much more. Um, so that's where we're spending our energy this November. Um, the uh, abolish or repeal Costa Hawkins um, is something that actually was on the ballot previously. So we've written a couple of blog posts about our position on that issue. Um, once we're done with q and I'll take a moment to drop those in the chat and you can read a little bit more about where we stand on that issue if you would like. Um, so thanks for that question. Um, thanks everyone else for starting to submit these. Um, I've got some additional questions in here as well. Laurel asks, what type of advocacy opportunities are available during the shelter in place order? 
Um, well, I just mentioned the Schools and Communities First campaign, and there's going to be some really exciting things coming up on that one. Um, we're going to be starting phone banking to voters um, in just a couple of weeks. Um, so if you subscribe to our newsletter, you'll get notified when those volunteer phone banks begin. Um, and we'll be having them on a weekly basis um, through the campaign. So would love it if you could join us in contacting voters um, to support schools and communities first. Um, there's also some stuff we're doing with Tech Exchange. Herman, do you want to talk about that one? Yeah, so we're partnering with the community organization Tech Exchange, which is all about getting um, our community more digitally connected. So if your company would like to donate computers or any type of technical equipment, or you yourself would like to donate one, or you just want to volunteer with them, um, we're, uh, we have a volunteer intake form on our website, which you can sign on to, and it breaks down uh, what opportunities are available, and we can connect you with Tech Exchange for that one. Awesome, we've got another question in here, Herman, that asks, do you have some data on before COVID and after COVID data on the housing crisis, like top two to three things that have surfaced? We don't have like concrete data. Um, what we do have and the one that we've seen um, impacted immediately would be the unemployment chart. Um, this one right here, which only goes to April and it's now in June. So the number is probably uh, way higher. So I think as people are continuing to study what's going on with rents, especially um, with evictions, I think we'll start getting to see a better understanding of what's going on in the housing world. Um, but certainly right now, what there is available is mostly unemployment. Sorry, I had to mute there, the dog started barking, classic Zoom problems. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, one, one other thing that you could check out is the webinar that we have coming up on the 18th, um, which is how COVID-19 has gutted California's budget. Um, and that will give you a sense of how some of the programs in the state are being affected by uh, mm -hmm. COVID-19. Um, but I think uh, more data about the lasting impact of this crisis is um, still to come from, you know, academics and research organizations that we rely on for information. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, we still have time for a few more questions if folks want to submit um, additional ones. Um, we've got another question that asks, is your work informed by victims of violence, like domestic violence or human trafficking survivors? Uh, is your work informed? Uh, our work is mainly informed by um, our community, which is mostly compiled of tech workers um, and community organizations. So that's who uh, is in, who we're directly organizing with. So, to that question, um, it would be no. Yeah, so I would say that um, uh, domestic violence and human trafficking are a little bit outside of our issue areas. I mean, certainly there are some intersections in terms of housing and workforce and labor, um, but it's a little bit out of scope for us. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is, you spoke about redlining. Is this still an existing problem? I think that that's a really good question. And just going back to uh, what redlining was all about, um, uh, the consequences of redlining are still persistent today. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of the communities that were redlined are today um, threatened by gentrification. Um, those communities aren't uh, growing as much, don't have a lot of opportunity, don't have a lot of prosperity for the people within there. So redlining definitely is still impacting those communities and historically has for the past couple of decades. Um, and like I said, it's, it's happened all throughout the Bay Area, all throughout California, and all throughout the country. So we're still living through those uh, repercussions.
Any other questions from folks? Give it about two more minutes. Uh, someone's asking, what are the greatest areas of need within your organization right now? Um, I think definitely it'd be um, volunteers for some of the projects and campaigns that we're uh, working on. And I'd say just like getting the word out there about our work. Uh, um, as, many tech, as many tech workers and companies that are willing to work with us, I think would be great. So I think the greatest, like I said, the greatest needs of our of our organization would be getting the word out there about our work and having people sign up to to volunteer with us, having people sign up to uh, lobby with us, signature gather with us, um, just trying to get our, our work more out there. Um, let's see, someone asked, is there a, any way to access this whole webinar? So uh, we'll be sending out an email with the link to the recording. So you'll have the whole recording, the whole webinar, and we'll also have a link to the presentation slides. Um, so we'll be sending out a follow-up email afterwards. Any other questions? Sorry, everyone, my Wi-Fi went down right in the middle of this, which uh, we love. Um, we have another question that asks, can you talk more about the tech equity team, for example, how did it get started? How many members do you have? What type of volunteering activities do you do? Did you already answer this one, Herman? No, no. Um, a little bit about how we got started. So our executive director um, and a, a couple other people were uh, beginning to notice some of the inequities within their neighborhood. And we're just thinking about how they as tech workers could start helping um, solve some of these issues. So that's how the organization came to be. Um, just like looking at, at that group, looking at themselves as like, we're in a unique position of privilege. Um, we're tech workers and we should be helping. There's rising uh, rents, there are people getting evicted, there are um, increases in homelessness. So like, what can we do? And that's how our organization came together. Um, it started in 2017, Megan, if I'm correct. Yeah, I mean, we, when we formally got our nonprofit papers yeah. versus when it was a, a fledgling idea in our executive director's head kind of makes the exact timeline fuzzy, but yeah, yeah we started about three and a half, four years ago. Yeah, so we're still relatively a new-ish organization, but we're still driving like pretty good amount of impact um, on the ground. Um, so yeah, how many members do you have? What type of volunteering activities do you do? Um, in terms of volunteering opportunities, uh, like I said, we have civic tech opportunities. So sometimes uh, we help build um, websites for people. Um, so the Oakland Indie Alliance, which is a network of small businesses in Oakland, um, needed help to develop like a landing page or a website with uh, where people could go to and look at local businesses. So with the help of civic tech volunteers, um, they donated their time, their skills, they were able to help build that out. Um, we also have the tenantprotections.org uh, website, which I talked about, but uh, we also have um, other opportunities. For example, we were doing signature gathering for schools and communities first. So we went out um, to farmers markets, we went out to different marches that were happening earlier in the year and we were uh, hosting volunteers there to help us with signature gathering efforts. So depending what we're working on, different volunteer opportunities come up, but I definitely uh, highly suggest that if you're interested in participating with us, but are unsure that you reach out to us and we'll find a way to get you connected somewhere. Awesome, yeah, and I just dropped a couple of links in the chat um, on our about page of our website. There's more information about 
how our organization got started. Um, and we've also got our staff page there. So if you want to learn more about, you know, the team that makes up the organization, um, you can find that information there. Um, let me just check the Q&A really quick and see if we have anything else. Um, so the other question that we have is, are you doing anything to promote more diversity and inclusion in the tech industry in order to have a bigger force of tech workers contributing to fight these issues, for example, outreach in schools or universities? Um, that, that's a good question. Um, we're not directly doing any outreach in schools and, and universities in the moment. Um, sometimes our executive director guest lectures um, classes, but we're mainly trying to contact companies and meet them directly where their, their workforce is at. Um, Megan, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so our organization's kind of theory of change or how we address this issue of making the tech sector more diverse is that we really feel like we need to change the conditions in which the tech sector is growing. Um, mm -hmm. No matter how much university outreach you do, um, it's not going to work out very well if um, the, the communities in which these tech these tech companies are situated um, are not welcoming to people of color, right? If that housing is not affordable um, and families can't live here, if only, you know, young, single, childless people can afford to live here, right? Um, so we're looking more at the policy conditions that contribute to that lack of diversity and kind of the ecosystem in which the tech sector is situated. Um, there are tons of sort of diversity, equity, and inclusion organizations that focus specifically on you know, things like uh, recruiting at universities or getting more young uh, Black, uh, Indigenous, and people of color into STEM fields, et cetera. Um, so tons of amazing organizations in that space already. Um, we kind of feel like we want to look at the other end of the equation, which is the ecosystem in which these companies are situated, which is why we're working on housing affordability to make sure that folks can afford to have a, a roof over their heads where these amazing tech jobs exist. Um, and that the jobs within the tech sector that people are getting um, are family sustaining jobs that have good benefits and mm -hmm. fair wages. Um, so that's where our focus sits rather than on, you know, visiting universities or that sort of thing. Um, well, we're coming up on one o'clock. Um, so I think this is a good place to wrap it. Um, if you have not yet taken a moment to become a member of Tech Equity, I'll make one more appeal for you to do that. Um, our organization is only as strong as our membership. Um, when I go into a legislator's office and talk about bills that we can pass to support our advocacy agendas and make the Bay Area more affordable and livable for everyone, one of the things legislators always ask me is, how many members do you have? Um, and the, the larger that number, the more weight we have to throw around in those conversations. Um, so we'd really appreciate it if you would join us as a member. You can join for as little as $10 a month or $100 a year. Uh, and that gives us the resources and also uh, the people power that we need to move forward on all these issues that Herman just spoke about. Um, you can become a member at techequitycollaborative.org slash membership. Um, and we thank you so much for taking the time to learn about our work today. And we hope you seriously consider joining us as a member, volunteering on our campaigns, attending some of our future events and telling your friends about our work. So thanks so much, everyone. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining and hope to see you at a future event or as a member. Thank you. Bye everyone.